within the European health within the European health data space, we expect that all types of health data will be integrated for primary use of data in healthcare, I mean for diagnosis and treatment, and for the secondary use of data for research and policy making. So that will sure require new approaches for patient empowerment, data sharing and data access and more interoperable infrastructure across Europe. So the three talks today will share different expertise on health data sharing, access, and exchange from the ongoing projects and activities in the US and in Europe. But at first, let me remind you that please send all of your questions or notes or recommendations through the QA tool during the session. And, uh, uh, and I will put in the chat some important links aligned with our conference, like the digital health competition in, in Friday, and also the special issue that was launched uh, in conjunction with our symposium for uh, the, uh, with the frontier in digital health. So I will best soon the two links. But let me, let me first welcome our first keynote speaker, Ms. Jan Oldenburg. Jan is principal of Parsvetri Health Consulting in the US. She has more than 20 years of professional experience in healthcare, digital transformation, practice, and policy. Currently, Jan is a, the co chair of HL7 Health Level 7 Patient Contributed Data Workgroup. Group. I joined this wonderful group two years ago and I enjoyed all the meeting, collaboration, and discussion led by Jan. So today, Jan will highlight why patient-contributed data can empower collaboration with patient. So please, Jan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, and let me take a moment to bring up my presentation. I'm hoping you can see my presentation. Yeah. Great. Okay, so I am here to talk to you about patient contributed data, um, in particular, why it matters and how it can be integrated into clinical practice. Along the way, um, we will talk about some of the questions this raises, some of the reasons that um, people are struggling with this, uh, and we'll look at some recommendations for moving forward to the future. And if I can get my cursor to move, there we go. Um, again, I am crediting heavily the team from HL7, of which Rado was a part, that worked on this. Um, we really spent two years working on creating a white paper. And I'm um, going to give you a short uh, illustration of some of the issues that came up. You will see at the end, and I'm assuming there will be a place where you can get copies of the presentation. You'll see both the team uh, that contributed and also a link to the white paper, which we are in the process of re revising. So as I mentioned, the context is our white paper. We wanted to address what patient contributed data is, why it matters, and how both standards and policy can be changed to improve the capabilities for patients and for providers. Um, but as we thought about this, a part of what this effort really involves is it's an effort also in culture change, in that we hope to raise the awareness, frankly, worldwide, of the value of patients and their data in collaborating with clinicians around um, getting to better health and better health faster. Uh, so I hope that by the end of this discussion, you too uh, will have um, the fervor about why we need to make changes and how you can contribute. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about what it is. Um, we spent a remarkable amount of time actually trying to decide how to really um, define patient contributed data. 
So, uh, and, and it starts honestly with the word patient um, because uh, actually people um, may be collecting data that they later contribute in their role as patients, but they may collect it as an individual, not in relationship to their role inside of a health system. Um, but in the moment when it starts to enter the interaction, the likelihood is that they are at that point operating in the patient role. So we did use patient in the diagram. Um, and it's partly it's data available to the person. It might be created by them. It might be uh, uh, created from devices uh, or sensors or uh, apps that the person is using. Um, it may be uh, bringing in some data from their medical record, but in short, it is data available to that person. Now, it may be shared with the team member. It doesn't have to be shared with the team member to be patient contributed in the sense that the person may collect data for their own purposes and then share a piece of it or a finding that they've identified from it with a care provider. Um, but the data is really collected in the service of the patient. Um, and when it is contributed, it is used to form health, inform health and care for the person, potentially for the population, and it's used to inform public health and research. And in those roles, it matters that the data with the person's permission is accessible to others outside of their purview. We also were coming from an environment in the States in particular, where there had been some work done in the kind of uh, 2010 to 2018 frame by the Office of the National Coordinator of Health IT to define what patient generated health data is. And uh, we felt that uh, while patient generated data is absolutely a part of patient contributed data, we wanted to highlight some of the ways that patient contributed data is a little bit broader than patient generated. So patient um, generated health data are the items in the bo blue box on the left. Um, and it might include a wide variety of information that's available to the person or collected by the person or produced by their body. Um, but then there are other kinds of uh, data that could be uh, patient generated or could be contributed by the patient, i.e. a review of clinical data um, by the person. Um, the digital dust that they create as they meander through the internet and uh, living their lives can contribute to health information. And then, of course, there are specific things that patients contribute. Family history is almost always completely contributed by the patient. Um, clinical data that might be in the custody of, patient, of the patient, i.e. they have downloaded it or received it from a separate health system um, and not, might now be uh, providing it to another physician in the context of current care. Uh, there are external conditions or factors. Uh, I am an asthmatic, for example, and I have found that um, the ambient temperature, the ambient humidity has a huge impact on my level of asthma symptoms. That's an external factor that I can contribute, um, has an, an impact on my care. And then there's patient contributed research. And this is everything from citizen science such as some of the work done by patients on long COVID that has advanced our knowledge, or it may be a very knowledgeable patient who brings papers to a physician and expands that person's knowledge or a clinician of some of their kind. So um, we have a vision for how all of this works together. And I thought it would be important to contribute that early on. Um, and our vision is that the future of healthcare is preventive, collaborative, and personalized. And so you can see on um, all of those items, the involvement of the individual really matters in making this real. And 
thinking about how their data tells a story about what they want to personalize and how they want to collaborate is really important. We see a future where patients and their patient contributed data are valued as contributors both to their own health and to citizen science. Uh, we see that patients will be encouraged to collect this kind of data, whether from their own observations or wearables or apps. And we believe that the data in tools needs to be standardized so that the exchange of data across the spectrum can be simplified and harmonized. A brief example is something like blood pressure. Um, blood pressure might be a piece of patient contributed data. Somebody might take their blood pressure on a home device on a daily or weekly basis. Now, blood pressure is also a clinical measure that's contributed in, a, uh, in an external context or a clinical context. Uh, right now, there's no guarantee that the data that the person might collect at home uh, in their app or using a tool is actually apply using standards that we use in clinical data. Simple example of how this, even the same data collected in two different contexts, one patient contributed may not be interoperable. Further in our vision, we ended up saying that we think every patient should have a personal health environment. And that uh, goes beyond an EHR to really think about uh, a longitudinal record that is a repository for diverse clinical data from different systems, as well as for patient contributed data. It's a patient where the a place where the person would control their interactions and give permissions to others to access their data. Um, then clinicians or researchers can use it, but only under the guidance of those permissions. And we also see in that environment that there would be a diverse tool set that would enable visualizing the data, searching for patterns and correlations, providing personalized insights, and sharing all of that within an environment of collaborative partners. We really believe that honoring patient contributed data is one of the ways that we can bring about this more collaborative healthcare ecosystem. Um, and that we think has benefits for everybody involved in it. Uh, so why does this matter? Uh, you may already be asking yourself this question, but we really believe that patients need a voice that patients and their observations about their health are a rich resource and that that kind of data and perceptions matters deeply for collaboration. So let me give you a few examples of this. Um, this is a, a set of tweets actually from um, a person called ODO11. And she says, one of the recurring devaluing experiences of chronic illness is how you depend on a doctor to write down words that actually capture your situation correctly and how your own words are given no weight at all by the many gatekeepers you encounter in medical care. I don't know how often I felt unheard, how often I've been treated as an annoyance by both sides, caught between doctors who couldn't imagine how little weight my words would have and gatekeepers who insisted my words had no weight at all and only the doctor's words matter. Another person who encapsulates some of the ways that patients can provide value is Nicole Lee Schrader, who talks about the, the amount of preparation she does for a visit and what she brings into the encounter and how often that work, the data, the prep is not valued by participants in the medical system or recognized um, at all in the framework. In fact, um, later on in this presentation, I have a picture. I was looking for a picture that showed collaboration between patients and doctors. And I specifically wanted one that showed the patient talking as a minor way of showing collaboration. And you know what? There are a few that show collaboration, but they're almost all, the body language clearly displays, it's the doctor talking, it's not the patient. 
We don't have an image culturally of patients really as contributors to a dialogue about their own health. But we know that patients can find errors in their medical record that could be clinical, clinically relevant. Um, this would be better in person, but one entry in my medical record showed that my BMI was 63 um, and that my weight was more than 150 pounds greater than uh, my actual weight. Um, I could tell that. Um, eventually, perhaps a clinician would have noticed, but that's something that needed to be changed for a wide variety of safety reasons. Um, Morgan Gleason is another patient ad advocate and activist. And at age 19, she found that her medical record said that she'd had two pregnancies and one live birth. None of it was true. It also said she had diabetes, which was not a clinical condition for her. So people, you know, when looking at their records, can find conditions and surgeries they didn't have, medications they've never taken, allergies they don't have, while allergies they actually do might be missing, and also lab results or test results from other patients. So um, we need ways for them to provide feedback on those errors. Um, also, I know you talked about this yesterday, but patients provide lived experience. Amanda Green, um, who is a lupus patient, um, told me once in an interview, uh, and I don't, she was speaking of doctors, uh, you may have a medical degree doctor, but I have a PhD in the lived experience of lupus. She went on to talk about how often doctors confuse the one hour, the one day that they had a medical lecture with someone who has been living with the condition throughout their lives, uh, and we want to reflect that. But also there's a subgroup of patients who collect data that actually aids in their diagnosis and treatment. Um, Kate and Christina Sheridan um, encountered a situation where Christina, the daughter, um, became seriously ill. She went in a matter of months from being an athlete to being a um, almost bedridden. So 30 doctors and uh, 15 diagnoses later, their data finally helped them and their doctors identify and treat Christina's Lyme disease. And they did elaborate tracking and graphing in sh to showcase this. Adrian Pichon, who's a member of our committee, studies endometriosis, which is an enigmatic illness. Because it can affect so many different body systems, she's created an app to help people track and then display all of that context and the many body systems that are affected. People need more of those kinds of tools, not just things that they have to invent on their own um, to help them illustrate and share their experiences. Sarah Regeer, who um, is a patient who used her experience of self-tracking Parkinson's as the basis for her PhD, really talks a lot about the personal science cycle. And one of the things Sarah is quite famous for collecting, for creating is this graphic on the right that illustrates that uh, during a year, she spends one hour in neurological health care and 8,765 hours in personal self-care. So when we dismiss self-care as an entity or a component of the health system, and when we dismiss the data that may arise from it and the insights, we really dismiss uh, a lot of the actual experience of what's going on and the insights it can generate. In our white paper, we created five patient journeys um, to illustrate how and why PCD matters. Um, Anne is an asthma patient. She's moving to a new state. She actively tracks her symptoms, medications, and peak flows and how they interact with her condition. She illustrates how important it is to have interoperable data that includes self-generated health data and also how important it is to be able to find a physician who can work with you in collaboration, especially when you're coming from that environment. Earl has been diagnosed with cancer. 
And we use his situation to illustrate how family caregivers can be real participants in both generating and working with a person's treatment plan. Marcus has heart disease and his outpatient treatment is managed in a medical context. His profile is based on work um, at the University Hospital in Salzburg, Austria, that Rada contributed. And it's a great example of true collaboration built into the way people experience and manage their illness and how they participate with physicians. Wilma is self-tracking for long COVID, uh, and she's got a Native American context, which changes some of the ways she thinks about her personal data and how it reflects her community. She's participating in a citizen science project with other long COVID patients and ends up being a part of educating her physicians on some of what she's dealing with and what matters. And Marcella is tracking her symptoms to aid in diagnosis and treatment of endometriosis. This is based on some of Adrian's experiences and use cases, um, but it, uh, illustrates how when you have an enigmatic condition, a wide variety of factors may be in play that are difficult for our specialized medical systems to process. So these are great and rich examples that illustrate some of the variation in types of PCD, some of the current barriers to getting it used, and the potential for real collaboration using these kinds of data. We hope that that will be one of the things that is used widely um, as a result of our white paper. Now, I'm guessing I don't have to tell you that there are current barriers to the use of this kind of data. Um, one of them is the culture change I talked about early on. Medical care today is often not collaborative and often doctors dismiss PCD, um, partly perhaps because it often comes in as individual data points, as opposed to telling a story that can help them understand how it works in conjunction with the treatments um, and medical care the person is getting. Um, I also mentioned earlier that the information that we're producing, in these apps, wearables, trackers, is often in non-standard formats, mats. And let's be honest, you know, there are, I'm going to say a gazillion kinds of apps and trackers. That may be a slight exaggeration, but basically there are a lot of them and there are no clear ways for somebody, um, either a clinician or a patient, to really measure the clinical efficacy and accuracy of those tools. And that's something that's really important if we expect these tools to be used more widely. Um, and there's another aspect of it, of course, which is how interoperable their data is. When uh, EHRs do receive uh, PCD, and we often think of this as um, solicited PCD, I want you to track X for a while, or please use this app um, in conjunction with our portal to record your symptoms. Um, but Often even that is collected and stored in the EHRs as blob text as opposed to interoperable data. And then there are way too few tools for consolidating, graphing, and storing this information. Um, I often reflect on how many apps or sensors are gathering tons of data about individuals, and they're returning almost none of it in the form of insights or feedback, or even a sense of how that person operates in the context of other people experiencing the same things or tracking the same things. And we also know that individual readings may not be helpful um, in part because they don't showcase trends or give a context for the data, and all data is really better in context. So we've got barriers to overcome in thinking about this. Um, and as we started to wrestle with what our recommendations really would be and how to think about an ecosystem that fully appreciates all of this stuff, we started to think about um, a lot of things that generated provocative questions. 
And I thought for the purpose of the consortium and as you work with these concepts going forward, that bringing forth some of the hard questions might be useful to you and useful to the dialogue. So one of the questions that we encountered was really where, where does this data belong? Does it belong in the medical record? Well, you know, that's already a pretty bloated place and it's trying to be all things to all people. Uh, and right now, often traditional medical records do not really have a place for discrete data that comes in the form of PCD. Uh, the data that isn't directly solicited by a clinician is often excluded, or it may be referenced in notes, but its richness is not conveyed in the record. And if included, um, it's, it's often um, only included when a physician has, or a clinician has validated it, i.e. put their stamp of approval on it, and potentially their interpretation on it. And this is one of the things that we realize there's a legal uh, medical record and a legal obligation to it. Uh, but it may make someone feel very unheard to have a sense that it only gets included if it's been validated by a clinician um, as it's a part of their record, whether validated or not. So we wrestled with this question of, should it be in an external record or a, or a set of tools like a personal health environment? Um, and if it's there, is the data consolidated or is it unconsolidated, i.e. lumps from different settings, um, which doesn't lend itself to great analysis or feedback? Um, if it's in an external environment, what, what's the pressure to make it um, interoperable because many people that create those environments may have uh, a reason to think about protecting their investment by making the data, by storing the data in silos that aren't easy to get out. And how accessible is it to clinicians or researchers and where does the role of patient permission fall? Uh, we ended up recommending that the ideal, it's in our vision, would be that personal health environment controlled by the person. But there's a lot of both cultural and systemic change that's needed to bring these kinds of solutions into reality. Another set of questions is how do we label this stuff? Um, you know, right now, uh, we don't always recognize patients as the authors of data. And I think a great example of that is family history collected almost at every visit. It's always recorded by the clinician, but uh, it doesn't necessarily highlight that it's the, this comes from the person, it's their recollection. When we do provenance, when we include that, we often don't show the history of the data and the different paths it's taken to get to its current form. So um, a piece of data may not have been collected by the current system, but it may have been provided by the patient as part of a medical record um, brought from another physician electronically or not. Or it may be from a set of data collected from an app. Um, and none of that richness of the history of individual data elements or data as a whole is really carried in how we look at the data. Um, we, uh, we already know that often, even when people have extracts of their data that are uh, validated by a clinical system, they were collected from a clinical system, when they're sent in by the person rather than the system, I know that um, sometimes they get ignored just because they've been in the custody of the system. And that really devalues the individual and highlights the way that uh, people may be thinking of this data as tainted in some way by its association with an individual. Um, but another question that arises when we think about patients actually having control of their data and choosing what data gets sent to whom, then what is the receiving clinician entitled to know about what was excluded? Now, we know that uh, 
currently in getting a medical history, patients ignore things or do not communicate everything but their history. Um, the, but we have the sense that when it's done electronically, we should know that. Um, but really, what's the entitlement here? And what are the rights of the individual versus the clinician? Um, we have recommended a taxonomy that starts to bring forth some of these nuances. Um, and we're hoping that some of this work will alleviate that tendency to um, downgrade or devalue data that's coming from the patients. We also um, want to note that there are some policies needed to support movement toward this. Um, I've already noted standardizing apps and trackers. Um, and it's not just creating standards, it's also thinking about What's the policy infrastructure re required in order to make sure it gets implemented, that uh, consumers know how to use it, that um, providers and data entities actually know that they should be implementing it and that there's some uh, rules about that rather than goodwill. Um, we know that policies must, must support key values. Um, Rada wrote the chapter that highlights some of the policy infrastructure that's required, um, both in an organization and actually countrywide and even internationally to support these things. And key is prioritizing equity, protecting people and promoting health value. And education at all levels has to support this vision. This is not a topic that's generally addressed in medical schools. Patients are not educated about the potential here, um, but we need that sort of thing to happen. And we need new voices with a passion to change healthcare in ways that embrace both the patients and their data. There are many recommendations in our paper. I'm highlighting a few here. One is increasing the awareness of this value. Um, this kind of thing does that, but we need lots more studies and white papers showcasing how physician-patient collaboration works and the value of this data can, that this data can bring to such collaborations. The policy infrastructures have to support, reflect, and encourage collection of this data and use of it. We have to figure out how to put it in place while protecting both patients' privacy and consent. And in this um, arena, Europe is far ahead of the United States, but it's a worldwide issue bringing that to everyone. And we need to think about that issue of standardizing the data and extending the way we think about provenance of uh, PCD data. There is still lots of work to be done, and our, uh, our group has one small part of it, but we really love to see conferences like this addressing the wider problems, and we hope to see um, the work progress in the um, un upcoming years to really make this a key factor. So in summary, and here, by the way, is the picture of collaboration as good as it got. Um, but it's time to build a healthcare system that honors, encourages, and provides tools for patient and doctor collaboration using patient-contributed data. There's an appendix that you can see when you get a copy of the slides, but I think we're now open for questions and discussion. Thank you so much, Jan, for wrapping up this nice work, two years work and this nice white paper. Thank you. We have two questions from the attendee. First question from Jan Hendrick. Uh, you mentioned the standardization of data collected from wearable devices and similar tools. Could you elaborate on that on this a bit more? Are um, are you actually researching how such a default data format could be done? Yes. Um, so, you know, really at the heart of this is um, a lot of the data that's collected from home devices. Um, a lot of the things that people are collecting on a regular basis on their phone with apps or with devices that are connected to apps on their phone. Uh, and one of the things that we know is that while we have a lot of clinical standards for the formatting and the interoperability of data, 
uh, almost none of them have been applied to uh, the data in, in especially in consumer apps and devices. Now, when we start thinking about um, implanted devices that are uh, actually clinic clinically implanted, my husband has an ICD, for example, uh, that data is more likely to be standardized, but it's also often not shared at the patient. It's generated by that person, but they often have no control over it once the device is implanted. Um, so really thinking through how we, um, it's almost how we rebuild this ecosystem to think about both how we use existing standards where that's what's being collected. Um, and I gave the example earlier of uh, blood pressure as a very simple measure that may not be collected in the same way by a device or in an app as it is um, when it's recorded into a medical record. Um, but there's a, there's a ton of them, whether it's uh, peak flows that you're collecting, as I do, or whether it's exercise uh, that you're collecting steps, for example, or whether you are collecting, um, there's just a ton of things that people look at. Um, it might be how you think about pain levels and what you track about pain levels. All of those uh, if we're really going to be able to uh, enlist this rich repository in understanding conditions and individuals better, we've got to think about how to standardize this data for interoperability. And, and frankly, we're already late in doing so. You are right. <laughs> so, okay, uh, second question from Alfred Winter. Hi, Alfred. Happy to have you today. Is a personal health environment kind of data wallet for a person? Would it make sense or even be possible to restrict such wallet to health data and to separate uh, that from the personal data? It's oh, you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that practically belongs in those provocative questions arena, right? Um, <laughs> so, you know, one of the things I think I, I want to start by saying is that uh, the segregation between your data and your health data is not necessarily a good one because you might be surprised at what kinds of data I'm personally collecting that actually speaks about my health if we're listening. Um, and some of that may be things like, you know, I may be a person who has uh, rigorously tracked my exercise or my diet for my own health, not in intending it to be um, applied in a clinical setting. But when I come down with the disease, all of that rich data about my past may be hugely indicative of what's going on in the context of looking at the disease and changes in functionality or even what normal is for me. Um, also, we, we are already seeing the use of data that we wouldn't think of as clinical normally to, um, to a aid in a bat diagnosis. Uh, one of the things, for example, is there's a huge amount of data that can be uh, clinical data that can be extracted from voice tones. Uh, there's an app that is 93% accurate in diagnosing uh, COVID from somebody saying the alphabet. We know that changes in voice tones um, can uh, identify depression in people, changes in frequency of posting or the kinds of postings or the words you use in social media can also be an indicator of depression. And we're starting to understand these rich layers of information that can contribute to knowledge about health, um, but may not be classically thought of as health data. Uh, another example from my personal life, it turns out that my, um, my asthma was exacerbated when I was working downstream of a garbage burner in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, that's not classically health data, the pollution levels at the place that I work, 
but it contributed to a fuller picture. So um, all of that is to say, A, I'm wary about constraining it. But I also recognize, I think, part of the core that you're getting at is how do I protect information that may be used against me, like my finances, although they're a predictor of health, um, and my, you know, my living situation, et cetera, from uh, data that is more classically health. And I, I think it's extraordinarily nuanced, and we've got to really move carefully. Uh, both to protect people, but also in making sure that the barriers we set up don't prohibit some of the collaboration we want. And I think Florian has a follow-on question or a question. Yeah, there is. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, Florian uh, from the panel, uh, because I can see him. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's a separate question, but I can type into the Q&A, so I'm asking it um, with more voice. Um, so you painted a really a bright vision. Um, but also I talked about a lot of problems, technical, organizational, but also legal problems or hurdles. And right now we have the situation that often even patients can uh, access their own electronic medical record, or at least not in an interoperable way. And in my view, there are even more problems coming up that we um, often lacking the possibility to identify patients across um, systems, so really basic functionality that needs to be there in order to make this vision, ha vision really happen. So in your view, what's, what, are, what is the most pressing topic here, or, or what are the, the most dominant problems we're facing? Is there some, some kind of priority? Hierarchy, uh, hierarchy of these things. You know, I, I do think, um, uh, you know, at core, there's an interoperability problem. Yes, but even when you know we have a future where all of that data is interoperable, um, if we don't have cleaner ways of building um, a longitudinal record and reducing duplication and looking across health systems to look at it. So it's so often these analytical tools that need to sit on top of the data as well as the organization of the data itself. You know, that matters and frankly, it, you know, PCD will be more valuable in that context as well. But I am a strong proponent of the importance of building a sense of self-efficacy in individuals and the understanding that this is their data, all of it, that they have um, the power to use it in their clinical encounters, that they have insights that are valuable in those settings and redressing that balance is I think an equally important cultural change. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, and keeping, keeping an eye on the timing.